Hey everyone and welcome back to another Android development video. Today we're going to talk about one of the hottest topics in Android development, which is dependency injection. This is a topic that really scared me for a long time, something that I face a lot of imposter syndrome with. It's two big words. There's been dozens of Twitter wars about this. We've got all sorts of libraries that help us with dependency injection and people telling us to use this one or that one. And what I wanted to do is try to avoid all of that confusion. Go back to the core fundamentals of why dependency injection is such an important topic in software and kind of walk through it in small incremental steps to help everyone feel comfortable having a conversation about this topic. Before we go too much further, I've also been told I need to work on my YouTuber mannerisms, so if you like the kind of videos I put out there, make sure you click like and subscribe the way we all hit invalidate caches and restart every three hours. I think it's helpful if we start this conversation by looking at some of the problems we face if we write code that does not use any sort of dependency injection. So check out this code on the screen where we create a profile view model. This could be like a state container for some profile screen. And it has a method that gets called once a profile is successfully loaded, and we want to track some analytics event to say the user viewed the profile screen. Now here we're using Firebase Analytics, so we're making a direct call, firebase.analytics.log event with some event name. Now this might not seem problematic at first, but something we might run into is when we try to write a unit test for this. We could create a unit test that creates our profile view model, calls the method on profile loaded, right? And then when we run this in our test, we don't have any way to verify that an event was actually tracked. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is also that this particular test will just crash and fail. That's because if we run it and we take a look at the stack trace, we can see this runtime exception about the main looper not being mocked. And that's because Firebase is trying to do some initialization or setup within its library that requires the main thread somehow. I don't really know all the details, but we can't run this on the JVM because we're not running on an Android device. And these are just two quick problems for writing unit tests. If we have code like this, we can run into other scalable problems, like what if we want to change out of Firebase in the future? And what if I want to update that in one single spot, which we'll talk more about later. Um, but I also want to say that if you have code like this, you should not feel ashamed about writing code like this. And that's because a lot of documentation for Firebase and similar libraries tells you to write code like this. And that's an interesting dynamic because companies that are building these tools, they want to make their documentation simple and show you how to use the tool. It's not necessarily their responsibility to think about testing, to think about maintainability, to think about swapping out dependencies for something else in the future. So if you're writing code like this, don't feel bad about it at all, but let's dive into how we can solve some of those problems that we mentioned. We can start down a path towards a good solution here by passing in Firebase Analytics through the constructor of the class. We can even give it a default argument if we want to always use Firebase Analytics, but this way we have the chance to, in our unit test, create a view model with some sort of fake implementation. And this is really what dependency injection is. We have a dependency on Firebase Analytics, and we are injecting it to the constructor of this view model. And this leads to a really interesting tweet from Kelly Schuster, which is, why is it called dependency injection and not just passing stuff in? And I think that's a really great way to look at it. I think one of the replies to this tweet said, dependency injection is a $25 word for a five cent concept. Really, all we have to do is make sure we don't have any hard dependencies within our classes and that we're passing in the appropriate dependencies so that in testing, we can use whatever we want or that in the future, if we want to change some implementation, it becomes as simple as changing what is passed in to these components. Now, if we do this, we can go back to looking at how we wrote this unit test, and we could consider creating a view model with some fake Firebase analytics. Now, this solves the problem that I mentioned earlier, but it brings up another question. Should we be mocking Firebase? Is it really Firebase analytics that I want to test, or do I just want to verify that some analytics event is being tracked? Also, what about the idea that maybe we switch off of Firebase to a different vendor in the future? What we should really do in these situations is create our own interface that 
has the contract that we expect our app to follow. So we could create an analytics tracker interface with mon one function called log event and have that consume some event name. We could create a concrete implementation of this that is some Firebase analytics tracker. And when we call log event, we call the corresponding Firebase method. But this way I could create a segment analytics tracker in the future or um, whatever other analytic services may be out there. So if we can do this, why does dependency injection seem so much more complicated than just passing stuff in? And I think part of that is because we get into broader topics about, well, what if I want to share dependencies across components? What if I want to define one analytics tracker and make a change so that every screen in my app is updated accordingly? Let's look at how we could achieve something like that in Android. If we want to share dependencies across multiple components in our application, we can start by creating a container for those dependencies. Let's create a class called app dependencies and put in our analytics tracker inside of here. Notice we'll default to using a Firebase analytics tracker, but what you'll see soon is that this one line is all we have to change if we ever want a different implementation. Next, we need somewhere to host that container. We can do that inside our application class. When our application is created, we can have that create our collection of app dependencies. And then once we have that, we need to know how to fetch our dependencies. We could do that from an activity or a fragment by getting a reference to the application context, casting it to our custom application class, and then calling the appropriate methods to get our dependency container, and then to also fetch the dependency we actually want. And now we have a nice approach where we can change one dependency and have everywhere in the app updated accordingly without having to make cascading changes down all of those screens. There's a recipe that was followed here, which is we create a collection of our dependencies, we create a host for those dependencies within our application class, and then we have some method of fetching those dependencies. What we looked at here was what some people refer to as a do-it-yourself dependency injection approach. We created our own dependency container. We created the container inside our application. We fetch all of those dependencies from our application. If we look at tools like Coin or Dagger Hilt, which are dependency injection libraries, all they do is help us avoid creating all that boilerplate when we have to do it by hand. But they all follow the same recipe. Create a collection of dependencies, put that collection somewhere that you can reference it, and then have each screen have some mechanism for fetching those dependencies. To show you that they're all the same, let's take a look at Hilt and Coin separately to see that they follow the same recipe that we just mentioned. Hilt is a dependency injection library that does all of its dependency management through the help of annotation processing. But it follows the same recipe that we just went through. The first thing we need to do is create some collection of dependencies. We usually call this a module, and that's what Hilt uses too. We create an object or a class and we give it the at module annotation. Inside of this class, we define all of our dependencies. The one we'll look at here is the ability to bind an analytics tracker. Now I'm not going to walk through all of these annotations step by step. I'll put a link in the description below where you can learn more about Hilt if you're interested. But what I would like to point out here is this binds analytics tracker method has a return type of analytics tracker. This is the interface that we defined earlier. But you'll notice there's a parameter here that is of type Firebase Analytics Tracker. This is how Hilt does some magic to determine that anytime we request an analytics tracker, we're going to return a Firebase Analytics Tracker instance. The next thing we need to do is set up the host container for all of our dependencies. This is still going to be our application class, and Hilt makes this incredibly easy by just making sure we add the at Hilt Android app annotation. That's it. Um, and then the next thing we do, need to do is be able to fetch our dependencies. We can do that in an activity or fragment in Hilt by making sure we use this at Android entry point on top of our class, and then anywhere we want to request one of these dependencies, we just use the at inject annotation, and Hilt will do the rest. We don't even have to think about where it's coming from. We know that because Hilt can create an analytics tracker, it will tell me how to fetch an analytics tracker. And one other nice thing about Hilt is it does all this at compile time to make sure that all of your dependencies can be correctly generated and fetched when we need them to.
Another popular library out there for dependency injection management is COIN. Now, COIN has a little bit of a different syntax from Dagger Hilt, but it's actually the very same recipe that we keep going over. COIN also has this concept of modules, where we create a module that is a group of dependencies. And here we can create a single, which basically means we're going to create one instance of an analytics tracker. And whenever I need that instance, I'm going to return a Firebase analytics tracker. We also need to go into our act application class and make sure that we start up COIN and tell it all of our modules so our application knows how to create those dependencies. And similarly, inside our activity, we can fetch those activities by using the buy inject um, delegate that COIN provides us. Now, I'm not going to do a deep dive into should you use Hilt, should you use COIN, or what the differences between them are. That's not the purpose of this video. What I want you to get from this video is to see that whichever tool you choose, they all follow this same recipe. You need somewhere to define all of your application's dependencies, you need somewhere to host all of them, and then some way to fetch them. And as long as you do this, you have a nice centralized configuration that you can change those dependencies anytime you want and have your entire app updated accordingly, which I think is really great. And what this also means is that whatever dependency injection library you choose matters so much less than why you need it. So don't get caught in all these flame wars about I should use this or I should use that or this one works and this one doesn't. They all work. They all provide some unique benefit. Dependency injection is important for the core concepts we talked about in the beginning. We want a way to test our code without relying on our production level dependencies. We want a way to swap out those dependencies if for any reason our company or the developers decide they want to try a different tool. And we also have that nice centralized location of all these dependencies. So I don't need to go chasing down in the app to figure out where the analytics track is created, where are these services created. You should have one nice collection of modules that can help you find all of that information. So I hope this helped make dependency injection a less intimidating concept for you, the way this idea has helped me. And again, if you really like this video, like and subscribe to the channel for more, and let me know what you think below in the comments. Thank you.